All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, let's see. Let's show my screen. There we go. All right. Uh, welcome to Using Land Documents in Genealogy. I am uh, Dr. Josh Goodman from the uh, State Archives uh, of Florida. I am the Archives Historian and I uh, spend a lot of time working with different individuals and groups around the state learning how to use different kinds of archival resources to complete all kinds of projects uh, in local communities, counties, uh, genealogical projects, things like that. So we're certainly very glad to have you with us today. Uh, just a little bit of information about kind of where we are and what we do here at the archives. Uh, we're located in the R.A. Gray building, uh, which is two blocks behind the Capitol. This is the headquarters of both the State Archives and the State Library. Uh, those two institutions have been around for some time now. The State Library focuses mainly on published materials relating to the history and culture of Florida. Archives, uh, we focus more on the unpublished materials, things like letters and diaries and government records and inspection reports and, and memoranda and everything you, that you can think of uh, that has not yet been digested and published into a book. Uh, land records do make up a, a nice chunk of the records that we have. We have about 50,000 cubic feet of archival material. You're looking down the hallway of one of five stack floors here in the building. Uh, so suffice it to say, it's a tremendous amount of historical material that relates not only to the history and culture of the state as a state, but also to each individual county and community. Uh, so always think of the State Archives of Florida as a good place to go when you're working on a project or if you have patrons who are working on projects uh, relating to the history and culture of your community. In addition to holding all of these materials, uh, the R.I. Gray Building and our research facility is open to the public. Uh, you can go to info.florida.gov to get information about when and where we're open and how to get here and how to plan your visit. Um, also, this is the repository from which everything that goes on to floridamemory.com is located. So if you've had a chance to visit and enjoy floridamemory.com, you know that there is a great amount of really interesting stuff here, including photos and film and audio and things like that. Uh, we also do a number of digital volunteering projects. So that's certainly something to look at as well. I can answer questions about that when we get to the end of the program. But let's kick off. Um, here's a list of, of what we'll look at today in using land documents and genealogy. I've kind of got it split up into three main groups of documents. Uh, my, my goal today is just to share with you the different kinds of land documentation that you can encounter. That includes land titles, so documents actually transferring or establishing title to a piece of land. Land valuations, so documents that talk about the, the value of land. Uh, and then land locations, how to actually locate an ancestor's piece of property in real space. And uh, I think that an important thing to work with, uh, you know, land documents, experienced genealogists will look at land documents pretty frequently in the course of investigating an ancestor. Uh, but for some folks, the, the first question that may come to mind is, is why land documents? What can they tell you that a census record or a marriage certificate cannot? And many of the meat and potato documents that go into genealogical research pertain more to um, establishing family relationships, figuring out who mom and dad are, who the kids are, and, and how these people are related to one another. And that, of course, is you know, building that tree. It's the most important part of, of establishing a family tree. But once you get the basics down, you can devote more energy to actually building out profiles of who the individuals in a family tree are, figuring out what kinds of things they owned, what they did for a living, where they lived, what kinds of public offices or, or private offices and corporations they might have held. And that's what a lot of the webinars in this, uh, in this series that we're doing this year uh, pertain to. And so that's uh, that's one of the big things about doing land genealogy, land document genealogy, is these documents that we're going to talk about today can actually put you literally in the footsteps of your ancestors. You can actually go to specific locations where your ancestors have lived and uh, and you can you can sort of see what they would have seen to some extent. And that's why we think this is so important. So heading into our first category of, uh, of land documents, that's land titles. 
And land titles can come from, from lots of different places. Um, most of the time nowadays when we obtain title to a piece of land, it happens in a private land transaction because most property in the state of Florida or in other states of the Union, um, the, land the title has already been granted from the state or the, the federal government or whoever sort of owned it in the very beginning. And so most of our land titles come through private transactions. But for many of the ancestors that you may be looking for in Florida or in other parts of the United States, uh, they might have obtained land either through the Homestead Act or through a cash sales act or something like that uh, from the federal government or the state government. So we're going to look at titles that come from all of those sources today. And I should mention, I, I've sort of already hinted at this, that many of the documents we're going to look at today are specific to Florida, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't look for these. There are cognates of these documents available in other states. Uh, so keep that in mind as we move forward. Looking at our first example, this, this is an example of a federal land patent, and it's called a patent because it's the first time that title has ever been transferred officially to someone. It's kind of like those letters patent uh, that go for when they create a new baronetcy or a new earldom or something over in the United Kingdom. They call those letters patent. This is very similar, except it's to land, not to a title. Okay, and uh, these patents were granted by the Government Land Office, uh, which is now situated in the Bureau of Land Management in the Department of the Interior. Um, and this would be granted to an individual who had received land either because they had, um, you know, applied for it through the Homestead Act of 1862 or one of the other Homestead Acts. Uh, or cash sales uh, pretty soon after an area would be surveyed into the federal government's uh, state plan system for, for measuring the location of land. Uh, they would make these, these plots of land available for private sale or public auction uh, or, or sale. And then uh, this is the resulting document. So it's essentially a deed, uh, just, a, just called a patent because of its origin. So getting a look at what's in here, the kinds of information that we get from this, uh, and this is also what makes it searchable, we get a certificate number, which is great because uh, those certificates uh, can be cross-referenced with other kinds of documents that are available uh, from the Department of the Interior or from the state. You get the name of the patentee, the location where they lived. Usually it gets no more specific than a county. Sometimes you're not even lucky enough to get the county, uh, but in this case we are. Um, you'll get the name of the land office where the, uh, where the patent transaction actually took place. Uh, and so this is, in this case, it's Tallahassee. There were government land offices in Tallahassee, Noonansville, and Tampa at one point. There may have been a couple more, but most of the old ones are going to be in those three locations. You get the name of the person who's getting the land. And then most importantly, right down here, you get the legal description of where the land is located, and it is a gobbledygook mess when you start reading it here. The northeast quarter of the northwest quarter and the northwest quarter of the northeast quarter of Section 7 in Township 1 South, Range 7 East. And what that's referring to is uh, when uh, the government first acquired Florida in 1821, one of the first things they wanted to do was get people in here to settle it as quickly as possible. And so they surveyed out the entire state of Florida into a grid system. It's imaginary. It has no relationship whatsoever to latitude and longitude. It starts from a central point here in Tallahassee, and it fans out in a system of six-mile square blocks called townships. Uh, and as you go east and west, those numbers go up. As you go north and south, those numbers go up. So, for example, right here in Tallahassee, right close to the capital, most of our land is in township one south, one east, or one north, one west, or, or one south, one west, one north, one east. Uh, but it, when you get down into the Keys, you've got townships that are, you know, in the 50s south, and then like in the 30s east or something like that. Uh, so it's, it's a grid system just like you learned in, uh, in um, grade school. And then those six-mile blocks are measured out into one-mile squares uh, called sections. So that's why you get, uh, in these legal descriptions, you get section seven. So that's one of those one-mile blocks within a township described as Township 1 South, Range 7 East. Now you can find a number of maps that, that uh, include that township grid. You can also get it as a layer to overlay in Google Earth. 
uh, if you type in Florida State Plane Grid uh, PLSS or something like that, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get that so that you can overlay it onto Google Earth. Okay, so uh, this is one kind of patent. We're going to look at a way that you can get a hold of these and how you would search these, but this is, this is a really sort of the meat and potatoes of what you can get from, literal tr uh, from federal land transactions. One other kind of federal land transaction that is sort of important for the, uh, uh, for the state of Florida is Armed Occupation Act grants. Uh, the federal government did uh, pass out, uh, they did give out uh, land, what they called land bounties to people who served in the military during the Second Seminole War, uh, at, which lasted from 1835 to 1842. Guys who fought in that war could receive land bounties as, uh, as uh, compensation for their participation in the war, and so they had to actually show that they had settled in Florida. And the reason they wanted to do that was they wanted people to settle Central Florida to sort of act as a barrier between the areas of white settlement in the northern part of the state and the remaining Native Americans in the southern part of the state. I'm going to show you an example of what one of those applications looks like a little bit later. I've got it grouped in the state patent section of the presentation because even though it was the federal government granting the, this land through the act, um, the records are actually kept by the state uh, land title system. So let's look at how you actually go to and work with these federal land patents. You can see I've got glorecords.blm.gov up here. That's going to go to a federal website. Let's go ahead and click on that. And it's going to take you to this website from the U.S. Department of the Interior. And let's say that you were interested in determining in whether a specific individual uh, had a, a plot of land in Florida that they received from the federal government. So this is if you know you've got an ancestor who was in Florida at an early stage and you'd like to see where exactly they own land. Maybe you've heard that they had land or you're, you're thinking, well, they were here at a certain time, so of course they must have owned something somewhere. So you would click on land patents here. And this control panel has got lots of bells and whistles. Let me go ahead and give you sort of a ground rule in working with this particular database and any others that have to do with land records. It is not nearly as forgiving as Google, so it's a good rule of thumb to fill out only the, the, the uh, fields here that you absolutely have to have to find your things, because if you put in one piece of information that is incorrect, the database will, will not find the search results that you're going after. So you want to keep it as um, as, um, as, as free and clear as possible. So let's say, for example, that I was researching our buddy Zachariah Deal, uh, who was in that example that I showed you of a federal land patent. Okay, and let's say that I'm a descendant of Zachariah Deal. I know he's in my family tree, and I'm curious to know if he had land anywhere in Florida. Okay, when I get here, I know, I know his name, and I know that he lived in Florida. Um, let's say that I have an inkling that he was in Madison County, which is, which is what we saw in the other bit. But let's say I'm, I'm not absolutely sure. In that case, I would probably leave out the county uh, because, you know, county boundaries change over time. And even though this particular website will return results for not only where something uh, was historically, but also modern county entries, um, let's say that I'm not exactly sure. I would, I would leave that blank in this case. And let's say I know that his name is Zachariah Deal, so I'm going to put in his last name there. But you know, Zachariah can be spelled a couple of different ways. Sometimes it's got a CH, sometimes it's got a K. And for that reason, let's say I'm just not going to put his first name in there. I'm going to try first to see what comes up when I search for all the deals in Florida. I'm going to search for all the land patents for deal in Florida. I'm going to click search patents here. And check this out, okay? I get a whole list. What this is showing me is every land patent in the U.S. Department of the Interior system, uh, every person named Deal who got a land patent in the state of Florida, this is what it's showing me. And it's getting pretty granular. I can see what county, modern day county it's located in. I can see what township and range and even what section. I can even get down to what's called the Aliquot part. That's that northwest quarter of northeast quarter uh, gobbledygook from that we looked at earlier. Uh, so I can get down to the specific parcel of land that I'm looking for. And I look uh, in the results here and I see Zachariah Deal down here. 
So I'm actually getting to see that in 1850, a couple of different times in 1850, he patented land out in Madison County. And if I click on these little uh, icons over to the side, it will actually bring me up a PDF of this, uh, of this property. And there it is. That's the one that we were looking at earlier. It's just that easy. This website is free to use. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, so it's, you can have a, a good time with it. Now, uh, one thing I'll mention, I'm going to bring up a name that, let's see, I'm going to bring up a name that's going to bring me more search results, like Williams. I think there's must be at least a dozen Williams in every county in this state. Now you look up here and you see that there's 36 pages of search results. That's a lot of people to work on. That's one of those cases where you might try putting a first name in to kind of narrow your results down. But if you're scared that putting a first name in like Zachariah or something is going to skew your search results, there are a couple of tricks that you can use. Um, for example, let's say that I've done this search for Williamses in Florida and I know the exact time period when my ancestor got to Florida and arranged uh, his, uh, his land or her land uh, purchase. What I can do is I can, I can sort these search results by date and go to the specific time period when I think that my, uh, that my ancestor might have gotten land. So that's a tool you can use. You can also uh, sort the results by county. You can sort the results. If you know the document number, you can search by that. Uh, you can slice and die the, dice this a couple of different ways. Let me show you one other cool trick. Let's say that I want to know who my ancestors neighbors were. Okay, I can figure out by using that township and range number that's in my ancestors legal description on the land patent, I can actually use this system here uh, to determine who my ancestors neighbors were. So for example, that document that we were looking at from Zachariah Deal was from township one south range seven east. Okay, I'm going to back out Williams here, and I'm going to, I'm not going to put in any name at all up here. I'm just going to tell the database to return me every patent for one south, seven east. Okay. And here we go. And I don't need to put in a, well, let's, let's put it in here. We've only got one meridian to choose from. If you don't do that, it's still going to be the same, but, but if you use this for other states, you may have to actually specify a meridian uh, and it'll tell you. Uh, in the land patent exactly uh, which meridian they use to get that legal description. Florida only has one though, thankfully. All right, what I've got now is I'm looking for every Florida land patent that's in Township 1 South, Range 7 East, which we know from our earlier search that Zachariah Deal had land there. As a matter of fact, here is his land listed right here. But check this out, we get all of his neighbors. We get to see all of the, got all the other folks who applied for land and received land from the federal government. Now, if I want to look at people who maybe uh, got land around the same time that Zachariah Deal did, that might help us know maybe who he moved to Florida with. I can search, uh, I can sort this list by that date and I can get to all of the people who acquired land in 1850. See, for example, we've got John Porter here who got a piece of land the same day that Zachariah Deal acquired some. So maybe that suggests some sort of a relationship. Uh, genealogists, you know that when the farther back we go, any relationships that we can establish, the better. Uh, so this is a really handy database to use. All right, so that's federal land patents. Let's get back to, let's get back to our presentation here and let's jump over to the next thing. Now in these uh, federal land patents, that is going to cover any transactions that take place between the federal government and private individuals through the intermediary of the government land office branches that were located in Tallahassee, Noonansville, um, and uh, Tampa, and maybe even Pensacola. But the state could also grant titles to land. The state of Florida, when it was, uh, when it was first established as a territory in 1821, actually did not own any land. The only way that the state or the territory at that time could, could own any land was if title to that land was granted by Congress. All right. Uh, and over the years, Congress granted many, many parcels of land to the state. In some cases, they would pass a law saying, all right, we're going to give so many millions of acres to each territory or each state with the goal of what they called internal improvement. 
And the idea was that by granting title to all this land to the state, that the state could then, or, or territory, uh, could then sell that land off uh, at whatever price they chose to, uh, and then they would be able to use the money to bankroll railroads or put schools up or universities or build public buildings. Um, and, and so the legislature could essentially do with it what they wanted to do. In Florida, pretty soon uh, after uh, pretty soon after these uh, Congress started granting this territory to the state, uh, Florida established what they called the Internal Improvement Fund, um, which was a government agency that held title and still holds title to this very day, uh, holds title to a massive amount of land that was granted to the state by Congress, uh, by Congressional Act. And so much like the Bureau of Land Management at the federal level would grant land out to private individuals through homesteads or other things like that, the Internal Improvement Fund would also grant land to individuals, sometimes through private sales or, or excuse me, through public sales or public auctions. And it's essentially the same process as what we just looked at. It just, because it happened at the state level instead of federal, it's recorded on slightly different documents and a slightly different database. So let's take a look at an example of one of these Internal Improvement Fund deeds. Again, works very similar to the federal land patents, just slightly different paper, kind of pretty paper. Um, and you see that it lists out here how much the folks are paying for it. We've got a guy named Michael Comerford here uh, in Jackson County, up around Mariana, uh, who uh, was purchasing land. And once again, just like we had in the other land patent, we are getting a legal description for that property so that we can go back exactly to the exact spot uh, where this is. I should mention, if I haven't said so before, that we still use this exact same township grid um, to measure our land today. So these, these legal descriptions, you can still go back to exactly where this is in real space. This is a real, this, this legal description for Michael Comerford still exists today. The land might have been chopped up into different kinds of pieces and sold to lots of different people many times since then, but that location is still in real space. You can get to it. Um, and then we get a little bit of information about how much acreage we're talking about, what authority uh, the, um, you know, the, the property is offered under, all that kind of information. So we can use documents like this uh, to find out lots of great stuff about our ancestors. So let's say that you have an ancestor who moved into Florida at some point in the 19th century, and you're curious to know where they acquired property. And you've looked in the federal land database that we just looked at, and you're just not finding anything. Or maybe you're not finding the parcel of land that you were expecting to find. The answer could be that they actually acquired a land patent from the state, not from the federal government. So we're going to look in a minute at the database uh, that shows you how to do that. But one thing I want to do before we do that is I want to look at an example of those Armed Occupation Act permits that I was talking about earlier. So just to review, uh, the Armed Occupation Act, this was uh, a, a land bounty program uh, passed by the federal government during the Second Seminole War, and it was to provide an incentive for guys to volunteer for military service in the war that the United States waged from 1835 to 1842 uh, to, um, to get folks to come down and, uh, and settle uh, in the areas uh, that, that had just been cleared out of, of the Seminole Indians, and there were still Native Americans living in the southern part of the state. So the idea behind this act was that they would establish sort of a barrier between those remaining Native Americans and the white settlers farther north. So 1842, they passed this act, and uh, you had to, what you had to do was you had to, you had to meet certain criteria. For example, we see in here that this affidavit uh, for uh, this guy, Elias Hart. He was actually saying, okay, I'm a single guy. I'm at least 18 years of age. I'm able to bear arms. Again, the idea was to create that barrier uh, between Native Americans and, and uh, the, the white settlers for the North. Uh, and that he had improved or that he intended to improve um, an area of land in the zone where this act was permitted to operate. And then he would send this affidavit in with a description of the uh, intended settlement that's down here, which we can't see it here, but we're going to look at an example where you can see it here in just a minute. 
Uh, he'd send in a description of the land where he intended to be, and he'd send that into the government land office, and then they would parcel out a piece of land. Uh, they, they would grant him a title to that piece of land, or as closely as possible, uh, you know, using the aliquot part system that we've been looking at so far. So what's great about these applications for land under the Armed Occupation Act is that not everybody who applied actually got a grant of land. Some of these were refused, either because they were too close to an existing military base, which wouldn't really help the federal government that much. They wanted these people to settle areas that were far away from military bases. So sometimes they refused them on that basis. Sometimes the guys who were applying did not actually meet the requirements um, that were set forth in the Act. So you can, you can get a lot of the same land transactions described in these applications just going through state land titles or federal land titles. But when you research these applications, you not only get the people who succeeded in acquiring land, you also get people who merely attempted to get land. So it's a bigger pool of people. All right, so now that we have those two types of, uh, uh, those two types of um, state level land documents, um, let's take a look at the website where you go and get these. Now this site can be a little bit cantankerous. Uh, it especially was in the past couple of weeks because of the, uh, the, the demand on, on uh, bandwidth for other services, but uh, we do have some backup screenshots. So let's see if we can, oh look, and it pulls right up this time. Amazing. Okay, so this is a land database that uh, is put out by the Department of Environmental Protection. They have a division called the Division of State Lands that kind of keeps track of all the different titles that are granted by the Internal Improvement Fund. They've got a couple of different ways that you can search these documents. They, for example, offer this web map search, which is handy. Um, I would actually, if you, if you know some names and some locations and things, I would argue for the document search because it tends to be a little bit more precise. Uh, so let's just go right into it. This is what the search panel looks like. Again, much like the federal land database that we were looking at earlier, you've got lots and lots of bells and whistles. I would strongly encourage you to put in only the fields that you've absolutely got to have, because just like the other one, it's not like Google. It's it's kind of a kind of a, a claptrap database. If you get one character out of place, it's going to throw the search results that you want out. Um, so. The first thing that you come to is document type, and this is really important because uh, there are many, 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 as you can see in this scroll thing here, there are many different kinds of land documents that are included in this database. We're going to look at, at several main ones. Um, so you'll see that it's got these, these uh, three-letter acronyms for all the different document types. I've asked them a time or two, can't you, can't you spell those out? And uh, they tell me they're working on it. But in the meantime, as you pass your mouse over each one of these three-letter acronyms, uh, they will show you exactly what kind of land document you're searching. And you can very quickly see just how many different kinds of land documents these folks are working with. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is some of the most popular ones, some of the biggest collections. First of all, those, uh, those deeds that we were looking at, those land patents coming from the Internal Improvement Fund, those are almost always going to be TFIs, uh, instruments from the trustees of the Internal Improvement Trust Fund. That's because these are the guys who actually had the legal authority to grant title to land. So it's their instruments that you want to look at. All right. So um, let's say that I had, and I actually do have, an ancestor uh, in Taylor County, Florida, all right, by the name of Hendry, okay? And let's say that I wanted to look up a title from, uh, from the Hendry family, all right? I'm going to put Hendry in the last name. I know that Robert McPhail Henry is kind of the guy that I want to look for, but I'm not going to put Robert in there because I'm not sure if it's going to be Robert or Robert M or RM. You know how they were in the 19th century with initials. So I'm, I'm just not going to put anything in the first name part. I'm just going to put in last name and I'm going to put in the county that I'm looking for. And I'm going to hope that it's not going to be too long of a list and I'm going to be able to find my TFI document, my instrument from the trustees of the Internal Improvement Fund uh, for this guy. So the screen will go dark for just a little bit. That lets you know that the server is working. And then it'll come back bright again. If it doesn't change, don't worry. 
it's still waiting on this to come up. Look here, here's our search results. It has found me some Hendry's from Taylor County. Look at this, okay? And it's going to give me, much like the federal document uh, database did, it's going to give me the section, township, and range of each one. If I click on any one of these, it's going to change what I see down here at the bottom of the screen so that I can get a little bit more information about who exactly we're talking about. All right. So for example, let's see, I'm going to click on, let's get, let's get one of these old ones. Let's get this 1885 one. All right. And so it'll show me some of the basic details down here about what this document is. And then if I'd like to look at it, I can click on this link over here to the left, the number there, and it's going to download it for me. Uh, and those down, your download settings on your computer affects where it goes. In my case, since I'm using Google Chrome, I can just go snatch it right here. And look here. Uh, it's just like the one that I showed you on the PowerPoint. And this one happens to be from the ancestor I was looking for, Robert M. Hendry. See, that's why I didn't put in Robert McPhail. All right, and it's going to tell me that, look at this, look how much he paid, 25 cents an acre. Can you believe that? That's incredible. Again, the reason they do this is they want people to get land. They want people to settle the area because it improves the vitality of the economy. All right, and I get uh, this wonderful uh, legal description showing me exactly in real space where Robert McPhail Henry had his land. Um, and then we get these signatures from all the different people uh, whose authority was required in order for this land to be granted out. So great stuff. Um, something else that these, uh, that this database is good for. Uh, let's go back to those Armed Occupation Act grants. Okay, and those are going to be under AOP, AOP. And you'll just have to, I, I encourage you guys to take a look and just look at all the different things that are available in here. Um, we get questions all the time about land documents and, and the, the, if you're looking for something that has to do with like an oyster lease or, um, you know, like a dredging permit or something like that, uh, typically it's going to be in here somewhere. Uh, so good stuff there. Let's say that I have an ancestor named Williams who I know got an Armed Occupation Act uh, grant because he had served in the military uh, in Florida during the Seminole War. Um, but I don't know exactly where it was. You know, he moved around a little bit. Let's just search and see what I get. All right, so I've, I've only put in the last name Williams and the document type AOP. So this is going to return to me every Armed Occupation Act permit uh, that's associated with the last name Williams. All right, the screen has undarkened and it's going to give me my search results. Here we go. And look, we've got, if you look down here on the year, we've got documents going all the way back to 1843, which is kind of the heyday of this act. And so I can actually download the individual permits and look and see what they've got. So this one's going to a guy named John Williams. I'm not sure if that's an L or a T there in the middle. My money's on L, but I wouldn't swear to it. And not only do I get, um, you know, all the information that we looked at earlier, but we do actually get this nice uh, legal description of the, where the land is. Fun fact, they don't always have a legal description that fits with the township grid because sometimes these guys were requesting land in places that had not yet been surveyed by the government um, uh, because there were still Native Americans in the area and they didn't consider it safe to send surveyors in there. Uh, so sometimes you're going to get things like start at the Withlacoochee River, you know, 500 chains south of the part where it meets up with Melviney Creek or something like that. Uh, so, so you can sometimes get some really in-depth um, legal descriptions that don't quite match with the new stuff. So uh, that gets us through uh, the different kinds of, of state uh, documents that you can get. Again, there's just tons of stuff, but the main things that you're going to want are those Armed Occupation Act grants. Uh, permits, uh, the TFIs, and one other thing that I'll show you while I'm here is what we call the tract books, okay, and that's SFT. And when you look for those, uh, what those are is whenever the government land office would record uh, the land purchases, they kept a, a list for every section of every township of who had brought, bought property in that area. Uh, so for example, if you're looking at section, town, uh, uh, section 27, of Township 4 South 7 
east, that's close to the town of Perry, present day, all right, what I can get is I can get a listing for everybody who bought property in that area from the state, and it also includes federal land purchases as well, which is really handy. Okay, let's see, we're still waiting. There we go. All right, and all of these are, these are all going to be the different pages. So I'm just going to click on one at random to get a look at here. And it has given it to me in, at the bottom here. Check this out. So look at this. This is a page out of one of the track books. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit just in case you're not able to, to get the picture on your screen quite as big. And check this out. What it is, is uh, I'm going to use section 26 just because it's up here at the top where you can see the headings. This is showing me every land purchase, both federal and state okay, for section 26 of Township 47, that, uh, 4 South 7 East, that, uh, and it's showing me the names of all the people who purchased land in that area. Super, super helpful when you're trying to figure out who settled a particular area first, because you can look at the dates of the sale, and you can essentially figure out who the first person was to acquire title in a particular area. Again, this is STM, the track books. This is a, a really great uh, section of documents as well. Okay, all right, so we need to move on for the interest of time to some other things. All right, the last, uh, the last land title granting document I want to show you is the Florida Homestead Application section. Uh, this is similar to the Federal Homestead Act, except uh, you get uh, uh, the, the state of Florida had its own homesteading program, uh, so that's going to be um, uh, that's that's going to have its own set of documents, and those are not retained by the federal government, they're retained by the state government. Now those are not available through any uh, online document database, but if you know that you've got an ancestor who homesteaded at some point here in Florida and you're not able to acquire the documentation for it anywhere else, it's always a good good uh, thing to try uh, the series of homestead applications that we have here at the State Archives of Florida. All right, and that comes from a very specific record series, series S1051 here at the State Archives, and I'm going to show you how to use the archives online, um, online catalog to get to that stuff. All right, and this is a great catalog for you guys to use uh, anywhere, uh, just because this is, this is how you get to descriptions of all the records we have in the State Archives. Okay, so I'm going to use a little shortcut. All right, because uh, in the interest of time and because this is going to help you get back to the records from a specific series, series 1051. Here we go. All right, and this is what we get in the search results. There's only one series with that number. We click on the number there. This is taking you to uh, a, um, a catalog record for that specific series of records. Now we can get into the guts of it. And look here we're showing you the actual folders within the boxes uh, that go with all of these records. So you're actually getting, look, it's even got the numbers of the homestead applications and all the people. Now one aggravating little bit here is that it's only going to give you 30 results at a time, but I'm going to show you how to cheat the system so that you can get a lot more. If you look up here in the address bar, you get a bunch of gibberish. But what these actually are, these are actually instructions to the database on how to display information on the page. And if I go to record max, that's actually the attribute that shows us, how, that tells the server how many results you want to see on the screen. I'm going to back out that 30 and change it to 999. That's the maximum that you can do. And it's actually, it's going to take a second here, but it's actually going to pull up a thousand records all at one time. And what's so great about that is that once I've done that, I can use the uh, Find tool, the Control F. That's how I just brought that up. In Google Chrome, it's Control F. It's usually Control F in most browsers. I can actually use that and then start searching for the name that I'm looking for. Like if I'm looking for Williams, I'm going to get all the different Williamses. There's Andrew, Willis, Thomas, George, Martha all these different ones. And so that's a quick way to determine whether we have a homestead application uh, for your ancestor. All right, here we go. Moving on uh, through time here, let's move into uh, private deeds. So uh, we've, we've talked about ways that individuals can acquire title to land through the federal and state governments. The last category of those is private deeds. 
Um, any time that land changes hands after it's been patented out from the state or federal government, uh, you switch over from having patents to having deeds. Okay, and that's when one private individual or organization or entity transfers it to somebody, somebody else who's also a private entity. Those deeds are actually recorded at the county courthouse in the county where the land exists. Okay, and those are kept by the clerk of courts. Every county keeps them a little bit differently. Some of the larger counties have gone through and kind of indexed them so that you can search them online. Many of the smaller counties haven't quite done this just yet, uh, but you can still go into the clerk's office and get a, a, an indirect or direct index uh, to these so that you can look up the exact deed that you need. They're really good at finding these really fast. You can oftentimes call the clerk ahead of time and they can actually pull the books that you need to look at or they can at least have it on their radar what you're looking for and they can help you out. So that's how you acquire those land titles. So if you're not able to acquire uh, the land title that you're looking for through either a federal patent or a state patent, oftentimes that means that your ancestor purchased their land from a private individual and so those records are going to be stored at the county level. All right, land valuations. Okay, these are documents that help us understand the value of land. The easiest one that most of you have probably encountered before is the census. Uh, most years that the census was taken, they actually included um, the, um, uh, the, the census taker actually included um, the value of the real estate and personal property that was owned by the head of household. One word of caution about these is that neither the census taker nor the head of household who is being interviewed were property appraisers. They didn't necessarily have a good idea of what the value of their own stuff was and nor did they want to because if you think about it, um, this is also the same kind of information that's used to calculate taxes and so a lot of uh, heads of household when they were approached by a census taker about the value of their property, they would actually lowball the value of it because they didn't want the, the uh, tax collector in their county or the tax assessor to be able to, you know, look at that and say, oh, I need to be charging this guy more in taxes. So this is not always the best source of information, but it is a start. It can at least tell the difference between an ancestor who was really loaded and an ancestor who maybe just didn't have that much going on at all. A much more precise source of information would be the records of the local tax assessor. If there's one kind of record that we see here at the State Archives that it is always kept with, uh, with great care, that is when you owe the government money or when the government owes you money. If money is, taking pl is changing hands, there's going to be good records of it. Okay, so this is an example of a tax roll. These can be kept, um, oftentimes they're kept at the county level, uh, but they also would turn a copy of these in to the State Department of Revenue or to the Comptroller. Uh, so we retain a copy of these for each county at the state level as well. You get the names of the heads of household in the county, and then you, there's a column for each thing that was being taxed. Okay, so for example, right here we've got the three different rates of land. Okay, and that, those classifications were made by the government land office. Swamp land, for example, would have been third rate. First rate is going to be really good land for agricultural purposes. All right, and you can see the different amounts, uh, and this is referring to acreage, not value. There was a, as you can see up here, there was a formula for exactly how much money someone would be charged for, uh, for their acreage, depending on what rate it was. Um, this tax roll from Madison County happens to be for 1854, so this is also going to help us determine whether someone was a slaveholder. It's also going to let us know whether they were being charged for lots in town, whether they were a business person and maybe they had uh, you know, maybe they had mercantile business that they were doing. At different times, they would tax different things. So sometimes people will be taxed for uh, pocket watches or uh, horses, carriages, cows, pigs, uh, goats, sheep, different things. Uh, so this is a really great document to use to sort of build out a profile of what your ancestor owned in terms of property. And again, these are available from the State Archives. It's Series S28 is the number here at the archives, but you can also oftentimes acquire these through uh, through your county clerk of courts if they have retained those records. Documents that refer to land locations, okay? 
So uh, city directories, that's the best ones uh, for folks who have property in town because the deeds uh, describing this land oftentimes do not actually use the aliquot parts. Uh, the older ones oftentimes will not. They'll just use lot and block numbers, which can be helpful, but what do you do if those lot and block numbers are no longer the same ones that were being used, uh, that's being used by the city today? City directories are great. They go back to the late 19th century. These can be acquired. Uh, sometimes public libraries, of course, will have them. Uh, sometimes genealogical collections or local museums will have them. They're also available through Ancestry and Family Search uh, and some other online databases as well. Um, there's two ways that you can look up property. The first is the obvious one. Uh, they tend to have an index by last name for each person, uh, head of household who's living in the community, so you can get an address that way. But what if you want to know who else lived at an address before your ancestor or after your ancestor? Like, like let's say you want to know who all lived in your great-great-grandmother's house after she died or moved away. There is a reverse street lookup grid. Uh, or reverse street lookup system in most of these city directories that will allow you to actually look up the address. So rather than being organized by the last name of the individual who's living there, uh, that reverse street lookup index is organized by the name of the street and then by house number. And then they show you the cross streets so that you can sort of spatially go through the information. And so, for example, this house where Leonard Wesson was living uh, in 1930, we can look at a later street, uh, uh, at a reverse street lookup system in a later directory, and we can see that this guy, L.M. Lively, was living in his house uh, later on down the line, that same address. So very handy. The last bit uh, that can help you, and this is for folks who are out in the country, if you're looking for a way to uh, kind of uh, locate your, your ancestors' property in real space. Um, when those government surveyors went in and did the original land survey in the 1820s and 30s on into the end of the 19th century, uh, they created a series of township maps, which are wonderful because uh, these were retained. Copies went to the uh, Department of the Interior in Washington, but copies were also retained by the government land office in Tallahassee, Noonansville, Pensacola, Tampa, different places, uh, so that they could use them to record individual land transactions, which you can see in here. And those numbers correspond with those patent numbers that you see on the uh, individual land patents. So this can be a really handy way to spatially uh, get a sense of who your ancestors' neighbors were. You'll also see that bodies of water and trails and roads are shown on here. And sometimes you even get houses and you'll get the names of, of individuals who maybe had plantations or something like that. So it's just a, a really great um, uh, system to use. Now where are these things kept? Uh, you can get them a couple of different places. Um, the, if you have, uh, uh, if, if you want to look at the basic ones, you can go to that same glorecords.blm.gov site that we looked at earlier, and you can look them up here in Survey Plats, and you just look up uh, the, you use the township and range, uh, and don't forget to put in whether it's north or south, east or west. Uh, you can look them up that way. You can also use the state plane system, uh, the state land document system that we, we were using earlier. These are better to look at. They're, they're not quite as good as scans. They're in black and white scans, so they're a little bit harder to read. Uh, but these are great because these are, are more recent ones that have a lot more markings on them from those government land offices, because these are the, the government land offices copies. And the way you get to those is you go down to STM, the United States Survey Township Maps and then you would look for a particular uh, township and range in there, and that's how you would get to those. We also have the originals that these scans are based on here at the State Archives of Florida. Uh, so you can look at them that way as well. Okay, so getting back to our PowerPoint here, one other, um, once you have taken a look at those historical township maps, if you'd like to look and see what your ancestor's land looks like today, um, there are a number of different ways that you can get a hold of, uh, uh, that you can get a hold of modern township maps. Uh, a number of different maps from government agencies uh, use these. 
And uh, but one uh, one little cheat group, so you don't have to work so hard to find them, is uh, the Florida Department of Transportation has a series of county maps that you can use that have township markings on them. So let's say, for example, that I wanted to look for uh, where Zachariah Deal's land was in Section 7 of Township 15, Range 7 East, and I know that that's in Madison County. I can actually go to FDOT's county website here, all right, and I can go down to Madison and I can download this map really quick. All right, it's going to take a second. These are pretty detailed maps. I hope it's going to give it to me. Oh, there it is. Okay, I see what's going on here. All right, now it's flipped this one. I'm going to go to a different one because this is it's flipped it. I know that a Alachua will behave a little bit better, so I'm going to go to that one. So take us a second. Um, but anyway, the township and range markers will be on the legend that they're, or on the, uh, the grid system that they use to organize the map. See, here it goes. And then as I look at this, you can see they've got range 19 east, range 20 east, range 21 east, township 7 south, 8 south, 9 south. You can triangulate where your ancestor's property was in there. And if I zoom in on this a little bit, not only do they have the township numbers, but they also have the individual sections marked in there. So see, we've zoomed in here a little bit. You can see where they've got the individual section numbers. So you just use the township and range markings on the side, and then you've got the, uh, you've got the section numbers inside of that. So a great resource, a free resource, uh, but remember you can also get that layer from Google Earth as well. All right, there is one very last kind of document that's kind of an outlier, so I just want to describe this super fast right here at the end, and that is Spanish land grants. I mentioned to you that earlier that land titles originally had to be granted by the federal government or the state government before they, uh, before they get recorded as private land transactions in the counties. There's one exception to that. When Florida was first acquired in 1821 from Spain, one of the conditions of the treaty was that the, Span the United States government had to recognize land titles previously granted by the Spanish government. And so, because this is the 1820s, anybody could forge the documents for this sort of thing. Um, what the United St States government did was they, they sent a commission down to St. Augustine and Pensacola and had all of the landowners bring in all the documents that they had proving that they had a Spanish title. Uh, to these plots of land that had been granted by the Spanish government. And uh, so uh, what we essentially have here at the State Archives is we have those dossiers. We have those surveys and wills and correspondence, all these dossiers of materials uh, that were turned in by these uh, claimants to, uh, to Spanish land titles. And some of them were confirmed, and the, Bureau, uh, the, the commission granted them fresh uh, clear United States titles to their land, and some of them were not confirmed. Either way, these are great resources for genealogists and local historians. These are actually all available and searchable on floridamemory.com. If you look on the collections page, the Spanish land grants are available on the collections page of floridamemory.com. Uh, so a great resource if you're looking at especially northeastern Florida around Jacksonville, St. Augustine, all the way down to New Smyrna, and even farther south. So there's that. Whew, that was a lot for one hour, but do we have any questions in our remaining time? Thanks, Josh. Uh, this is Melissa. If you've got questions, you can use your raise your hand uh, using the hand raise button, or you can type your questions into chat. Okay, Ramona, I'm going to get you unmuted. Go ahead. Ramona, you're unmuted. And it doesn't look like, Ramona, your audio's, your, uh, your sound is working, so if you can type into chat. And that says, will this be available on PDF? Yes, we can PDF the slides and we'll send you guys um, the link to the recording and the slide PDFs and everything in the follow-up message which should go out in the next couple days.
Or Ramona, it sounds like, okay, there we go. Uh, she said it was control up to bring up the thousand, her sound went out. Oh, is the question about um, to oh to to do that special search in the archives catalog? Yes, we can take a quick look at that. And uh, uh, let me discard those. Okay, so going back to the archives online catalog right here, and this trick works with any collection at any level. So uh, this was for looking at those uh, homestead applications. And remember, this is just the applications. So it's actually more people than actually received land. So this is, again, a great way if you're really hitting a dead end wall with your ancestors. This is a great collection to look at. So it's series 1051, and I'm putting it in quotes here so that the search engine will only find that one result, the exact one that I want. I'm going to click on the number one of the search result. That's the link. This is the catalog record for the full collection, but if I click on the yellow folder, it will take me to not just the uh, collection itself, but all of its contents. Now right now, the default is, is that I'm going to look at 30 search results at a time. It would drive you crazy to have to flip through all the pages to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here into this gibberish that's giving the database instructions and see where it says record max equals 30. That's the instruction that tells it how many search results to put on each result page. I'm going to change that to the maximum, which is 999. Don't try 1,000, it'll break it. All right, but 999, that's the maximum. And that's going to get me all kinds of stuff. And the collection may even go on beyond that. So let's look. Yeah, it actually goes on even farther than that. But I can now search this collection 999 people at the time instead of 30 at the time. All right. And so what I would do at this point, if I want to look for a particular family name, I would hold down control and hit F. And that's going to bring up this handy little search window. And again, that's the standard in most Internet browsers. I can't promise that that's how you bring up the find box for every browser, but most of them it will be. All right, and I can look up just any name that I want to. I wonder if there's anybody named Bolton in here. Nope, nobody named Bolton. How about, uh, let's see, I'm going to see if there's any, any, oh, look, somebody with my name in there. Somebody named Robinson Goodman. I may have just discovered a long lost cousin. Yep, William and Robinson Goodman. There you go. And Annette says, what about uh, Seminole Indian records? R records relating to land, uh, just, about the war, the Seminole Wars, or records relating to the relationship between state government and the Seminole Indian tribe, or may, there, there's several different kinds of records per, pertaining to that. So, so Annette, if you could just clarify, mm -hmm. she said, "Sure, whatever." <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, then the answer to that is that it really depends on what you're what you're looking for. Um, a few things that come to mind as, as being relevant, if you're interested in the history of the, uh, of the Seminole tribe in Florida and, and kind of what was going through the minds of white settlers and the territorial government um, in the 1830s and 40s as the Second Seminole War was taking off and those, those, uh, the, the difficulties between the natives and the white settlers that touched that war off. Um, I'd say that there are a couple of state level resources that might be useful, starting with the governor's record books from that time period. Um, there's a, yeah, a couple of things. Um, let's look at the governor's record books from that time period. Um, if you were to uh, go back to the State Archives online catalog um, and you were to type in Richard Keith Call, who was, and you could do this with any time period, just figure out who was governor at that time and we can get you back to the, uh, you can use this to get back to that person's uh, records. But Richard Keith Call, not only was he the territorial governor twice during Florida's territorial era, but he actually went into the field as commander in chief of, of, uh, of, of a group of U.S. military, uh, of a I forget exactly how many soldiers, but he actually went at the head of the United States Army and, and led an expedition during the Second Seminole War. So there's a good bit of material from Call that pertains to the war. So I'm going to search for everything we have on Richard Keith Call. And see this thing here that says Series 32? Okay, that's referring to the territorial and state governor letter books. This is copies that were created by their secretary and written into actual letter books. 
and we have, you can again click on the yellow folder uh, and you can see all the different governors and all the volumes that we have from all these different guys. And we've got, uh, not only do we have the um, uh, do we have the actual letter books, but we also have digital access copies that you can use. But since we're talking about Richard Keith Call, I have something even better to offer you. Okay, if you go to floridamemory.com and go to the collections page, we actually have a collection of records from the Colin Brevard family papers. We also have a collection that comes specifically from Richard Keith Call. And you can browse or you know you can look at all the different bits or you can search uh, for different things. Uh, so for example, if I was to search the call papers for Seminole, then I get some excellent material relating to the relationship between the call administration and the Seminole Indian Boys. So just great stuff. Um, this is just the beginning. There are so many things, and, and this is just the old stuff from the 1830s and 40s. If you want to talk about the relationship between the tribe and state government going on down the road, that's a whole nother kettle of fish uh, that we can go on for ages about. So yeah, just, just pop me an email, and I'm always glad to sort of do some consultation with folks who have questions. That's what we're here for. We also have a fully staffed reference desk that can take those questions, and, and uh, we're just super excited to help. Another question, are cemetery and or church records available? Cemetery and church records. Let me show you, while I'm here on Florida Memory, let me show you an example of church records that we have that might be valuable to you. Uh, back in the 30s, when the Works Progress Administration was coming up with all those ways to kind of keep people uh, on the job, um, the, one of the projects they did, uh, if you see here on your screen, I'm looking at the WPA church records. All right, and what this is, is they did a survey, they conducted a survey um, of uh, all the different churches who were in the area. They tried to find out some basic information about every single church in the state of Florida, when it was founded, who the first pastor was, what the first building looked like, where the first building was located, who the current pastor was, um, you know, all kinds of basic data like that. So you can find uh, information about individual churches, you can just look at the churches from a specific county like uh, now Annette you're in you're in Manatee or Charlotte I believe I think it's Charlotte so let's look let's just look and see what we've got on Charlotte County actually what county is the requester from Charlotte okay let's look at uh, Charlotte County here I'm just gonna look and see what we've got on every church in Charlotte County okay we've got eight records here now remember this was in the 30s so obviously many 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 churches had been established since that time so that might explain the low number of results but we're getting in here records from Akline or Akline Missionary Baptist Church Beulah Baptist Church all of these different individual ones and what that's going to give you is it's going to give you the form that that survey taker filled out about that church giving you basic information about it. Look here, we get the date of organization, the date that it went out of uh, business, whether or not the church uh, was incorporated in the records of the county, you know, the, the county's uh, book of incorporations, all kinds of basic data. It's not super, super um, detailed, uh, because in order for us to have a whole lot more than this, the church would have needed to donate records to the state archives. Now that has happened to some extent. There are some limited churches who have donated their records to the state archives, and we love that when they do that because it helps us tell the story of religion and, uh, and, and organized worship in Florida. But the number of churches who have donated like actual minutes and baptismal records and things to the state archives is actually quite low. Um, but we do have specific examples of that, and, and the way to find that is to go to uh, the the um, the actual uh, archives online catalog and search for the name of the specific church. Um, like for example, if I type in Baptist Church, I'm doing this just so I'm doing it this way just so you can get some examples of kind of how haphazard it is. If I search for Baptist Church, then I start getting See, like here's the record of Concord Missionary Baptist Church, Rocky Ford Primitive Baptist Church. It's picking up collections where maybe the Stone family went to a specific church, and so there's some records from it in that collection. But as you can see, it's very haphazard uh, which churches have given us detailed records and which ones have not. So 
if you're looking for just basic data, the Florida memory, uh, the WPA church records is really the place to go. Does anybody else have any other questions? We'll try to stay on as long as we need to to get your questions answered. Absolutely. Reason. Absolutely. And um, I should I should mention that we're again I and uh, and the full reference staff we're always happy to take even if it's just pie in the sky questions uh, you you don't actually have to know what you're looking for necessarily to ask us where if you're just curious about something very broad like an Annette's question about well what do you have on the, you know the Seminole tribe um, we're happy to start with that and help you drill down to to what what's really going to answer the questions that you have. Okay, we'll stay on for another minute or so. So if you've got any questions, let us know.